you very much. Uh, I was just going to say that. Fab. Okay, so um, just bear with me. Uh, just a bit of an introduction uh, to the session. Some of you who have been lucky enough to join us on the previous couple of days will have heard some of this before, but we know that we've got lots of new people too. So just bear with us while we do the recap. Um, so uh, this uh, seminar series is um, formed as part of some work that we are doing as our membership, as part of our membership for the Voluntary and Community Sector Health and Wellbeing Alliance. This is a collection of voluntary and community sector organisations who work with health system partners to represent the voices of people who are using the health and care system. Um, and it enables the sector to access the significant amount of expertise that is available on those frontline um, voluntary organisations. Um, our focus spans lots of areas. You can see the strategic priority areas on here. And we are specifically focusing on digital inclusion. Uh, we, as Good Things, are... Um, the UK's leading uh, digital inclusion charity and our mission is to fix the div digital divide. And we are the first digital inclusion charity that to be members of the Health and Wellbeing Alliance. Um, we ho hope to fix the digital divide by doing three things. One is that we have a national network of digital inclusion hubs the, that number over 4,000. Um, and through them, they provide community-based localised support for people who are looking to get online. Um, and they provide support with skills, training, learning, or just access, helping accessing the services people are looking to get into. Um, we also offer the uh, National Data Bank and the National Device bank which are free devices and free data to people who need them um, across the UK with very few questions asked and we're lucky to be supported by some amazing uh, partners on that. Um, so that's us and if you want to know more about us there are contact details at the end but please don't get hesitate to get in touch with the contact details that you, you received as you were joining this. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, this is the third in the series of our seminars um, on designing for digital inclusion in healthcare. Um, the Health and Wellbeing Alliance, our membership of that, has been running for the last two and a half years, um, as ha it has for many of the other voluntary organisations on there. Many of us have been doing digital inclusion focused or uh, projects or un trying to understand digital exclusion better. Uh, so the aim of this seminar series was to bring together some of that learning that we have all gathered across these last two and a half years. There are many similarities in terms of what we're learning, but there are also some really unique and special differences for certain populations. And we wanted to be able to surface those for the people who need to see them. So this is the third one, and we are focusing much more on how you design uh, good services to kind of mitigate the risk of pe people being digitally excluded. Um, the previous two sessions, if you haven't been lucky enough to attend, were recorders, and we will share the recordings of those with you as soon as they're made available on our website. Just a recap in terms of what we heard yesterday. Um, we talked a lot yesterday about the barriers that exclude people from digital health services and how you might move them. Um, we talked about how many of the barriers for digital exclusion are similar, but we also made it clear that it's really care, uh, important to take care to explore the differences of the groups you are looking to engage. Some of those barriers are more pronounced in certain groups than others. So really take time to get to know and understand the populations that you support. We know that digital services can be really useful. They can make services much more accessible to those who may be excluded and help with tracking symptoms and treatment. We've heard um, in previous sessions from uh, colleagues at NDTI about how actually some autistic people may find uh, remote or virtual appointments much more comfortable for them than face-to-face uh, -face appointments um, and how um, various systems can help track sy symptoms amongst certain populations. Um, and the final point was to think about how your digital services are going to be rolled out at a local level. What local support structures are put in place to make that happen? There will always be somebody who turns up at a reception desk at a, a, a surgery who is asking for help to make an appointment. Does the receptionist have the skills or the time to support them? What wraparound support have you made available to facilitate that, to try and reduce the stress and the burden on those people who have the least time? So they're the um, kind of uh, uh, overarching findings. So this uh, session today, we're going to be looking at much more practical solutions. 
I'm really delighted to say that we have got an a wide variety of colleagues joining us. Um, we have Carers UK joining us, the British Red Cross and uh, a digital midwife in the form of Grace from uh, Middlesbrough, which we're really excited to hear more about how she's addressing digital exclusion at a local level. And to begin with, we will also have an overview from uh, Karen at uh, NHS England, and I'll do some drawing together of some of the top tips and stuff that we've seen uh, shared by many of the other uh, organisations. So, there's the run through. That's what order it's going to be coming in. We're going to do our very best to keep on time and there will be time for Q&A at the end, as Joe said. So please do drop your Q and questions in the chat. Joe. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> so just before we get started with the presentations, um, we're really keen to understand who's here with us today in this seminar uh, to understand what where our messages are going and who might be hearing them. So um, we've set up a really quick poll um, and this is also to help us to understand, to do a, a rough evaluation of, of these seminars and understand um, to what extent the messages are, are helping people feel more confident and have more knowledge about digital inclusion. So um, I'm gonna launch the poll. There are three questions. The first is asking which sector or field you work in. The second and the third are asking you about your knowledge and capability or confidence at the moment around digital inclusion in healthcare. You might find that you need to scroll down on the panel to see the second and third question, but I will launch those questions now and we'll just give it a minute for everybody to read those questions and complete them. But don't forget to scroll down to the second and third question. Give it a few more seconds for people to have a go and complete the poll. Good to see a, a wide variety of um, sectors and fields represented amongst those of you here today, so that's great. Five more seconds, and then I will close the poll and we'll get on with the seminar. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Katie, back to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So without further ado, let's get a lot on with sharing some of our um, amazing insights and learnings that we've got for you today. So I would like to hand over to Karen from NHS England to introduce herself and just run through some of the slides. Karen, I am driving. So just give me a nudge when you need me to advance to the next slide. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Karen Hunt. I'm from um, NHS England, and I'll just be introducing the framework. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, I'm just going to highlight some of the main points. Um, I assume that the link will be put in the chat or will be circulated to people afterwards. But I'm from the National Healthcare Inequalities Improvement Programme at NHSE, and we published the inclusive, the, the framework in November of last year. So I'm just going to go through it. Next slide, please. Now, the need for this framework was um, pertinent because digital isn't going away. We all use digital now um, to use to study, to shop, to access healthcare, and to interact with our friends and family. Um, and there are massive benefits for the NHS in that 10 million more people are using the NHS and NHS websites and digital apps compared to pre-pandemic. Um, that's in 2021. Uh, more registrations on the NHS app from 2 million to 30 million between 2021 and 2023. And also there's been estimations that uh, the NHS can save around or patients can save around 350 million each year through reducing um, patient travel costs through using digital channels. Now, that's those are the benefits or just some of the benefits, but some people, not everyone's included, obviously. So we have not everyone has home Internet access for a start or even work Internet access. That figure has been put at around 7%. I think that was in 2021. Um, several several families and part of the population, 1 million, have cancelled their broadband package in the last 12 months. I think that was last year because of the cost of living crisis. So even though they're not a permanent group that's normally excluded, they've found themselves placed in uh, being digitally excluded because they can't afford broadband and digital is not always um 
cheap. So uh, also in addition, there's, there's digital literacy in that people, we found that 10 million adults aren't able to access digital services adequately because they don't have foundation skills in, digi in digital skills. And we also have 30% of people have said that the NHS is one of the most difficult organizations to interact with. So those are the, that's the case for action. That's why we said we had to put a framework together. The framework is not actually, sorry, next slide. The framework isn't really a strategy, it is a framework. So it's to provide direction and guidance. It's not to tell organizations what to do or how to do things. It's because that we, we had the pandemic, people were thrown online into digital services and we had to address that. Digital's not going anywhere, basically. So we put this framework together. Our mission is to increase the number of people enjoying the benefits of digital healthcare and ensuring that everyone can access transformed services using methods that suit them. Now that's quite crucial because it, the emphasis is on enjoying them, not having to use them and not enjoying them, um, and also using the methods that suit them. So it's a choice. Um, we, in addition to that, we want to maximize the contribution that digital solutions offer in reducing healthcare inequalities, but mitigate against the risks. And I'll speak about that in my next slide. Um, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Now, the framework concentrates on five core domains for action. We did we arranged a series of workshops when we were putting the framework together. And there were five areas that came out as the most crucial for having um, a digitally inclusive um, healthcare service. Now, when I talk about digitally inclusive, it also includes the workforce. Um, it's, the emphasis is normally on the public and patients, but the workforce also need to have these skills and the ability to interact with digital services. So. Um, the first core domain was access to devices and data. Uh, this costs money, basically. So not everyone would have access to de devices and data. And that's a, a, a key um, sort of cause of digital exclusion. In addition, there's ac accessibility and ease of using technology. So you may have, you know, up-to-date software, the, the latest gadgets, and you've got data as well, but you're not able to use it because you have a learning disability or a physical disability. And this doesn't have to be a permanent one. It could be that actually you've fallen ill, you need to engage with the healthcare services, and actually you're, you're not able to for various reasons that might have been caused by your illness. So we need to consider not just, you know, the, the usual suspects, people might say, but it is actually everybody because you don't know when you will become digitally disenabled. disenabled. Um, skills and capabilities. So you might have all the gadgets, the software, the ability, the accessibility, but actually you don't have the skills because technology changes really quickly. Um, so do you have the latest up to date skills? Are you familiar with the language and literacy of digital? And are, do you have the capability? Do you have the facility? Um, to actually engage digitally and beliefs and trust. And this is actually a big issue because uh, you may actually, be, you may have all the facilities, you may have the ability to use digital, but actually you don't want to. You know, you don't trust it. You don't want your stuff going online. You don't know where it's going and you actually don't want to use it. So we have to engage with those people as well. Um, so it is a choice and whether you can use it or you know, don't want to use it, we have to include everybody. So it's not just about um, devices and data and skills and capability, it's actually about those that want to use it and feel safe using it. In addition, as always, I suspect leadership and partnerships are crucial, particularly when you're dealing with digital because it can be fast, it could be changing, and we can learn from one another. So hence, uh, hence, you know, our presentation. So those were the key five core domains within the framework that we found could um, uh, influence the digital inclusion. Okay, now designing inclusively. When we, in the framework, it says areas that are particularly affected if you don't design, um, if you don't keep an eye on how you're designing services. At their best, the top row, the green row, um, it's convenient, um, it improves accessibility, 
uh you could you could book an appointment from work you can you know it's convenient but not for everyone uh, not everyone may have the space to use their phone or be allowed to use their phone or have a device that they could use um, at any time that they want to and that can exclude people um you have it can be engaging okay it empowers usage you feel like you're in control i can book my point when i want i could i could you know take my i don't know blood pressure and everything as i want but what about the people that aren't doing it are you able to access them are you able to see them actually because they might not have you may not get the feedback automatically that they're they're not using um, a digital appliance or they're not engaging so uh, you need to keep an eye on those. Um, flexibility, um, personalization. Digital is very good at using your first name and making you feel like it's all personal. It's all for you, you know. Um, thank you for your commission, Karen. Thank you for your your, your survey or whatever, Karen. Um, but it, it, alternatively, if you're not having that, don't forget that there are people that may not be getting that personal service. They should do offline, but it can restrict people that don't actually feel quite isolated or cold, that digital is not for them. And then um, control again uh, in regards to it has to be a choice, digital. That's what we're telling people that it's not, we're not trying to, I mean, the banking system is the example I always give, that people sense that actually we're gonna stop their services if they don't use digital. No, of course we're not. Um, we, we want everybody included, but we accept that there are advantages to digital. So you have to have various alternatives that people can access um, services. Um, otherwise, you can exclude people and you can deter people from engaging because although some people think, oh, that was easy, you know, I booked everything online, I, you know, everything was very quick and responsive and, you know, use my first name and everything. Um, there are people that think, well, I didn't like that. And if you force them to use it, digital, and they kind of don't like it, it's like, oh, that was embarrassing, I didn't like that, I'm not doing that again. So it could be a deterrent. So how you actually engage with people and design services is critically important. Next slide, please. So um, NHS England have identified areas that we can support organisations because we think that there are areas, what came out of the workshops when we were developing the framework, there are areas that may be missed or we can support better as a national organisation um, that other, other organisations may not be able to address. So I'll go through these very briefly, quickly. Um, we do support national drives to improve access to data and connectivity. During the pandemic, people may not realize that there are some websites nhs websites that you could have actually accessed without data if you didn't have data because an agreement was made i understand with vodafone so those are sort of national drives that we can enable um, we're also encouraging using procurement as a lever to increase digital inclusion so when you are procuring services you know be explicit about digital inclusion and reducing healthcare inequalities um, improving collection use of person level data and um, this was mentioned uh, previously, Katie just mentioned as well, that there are people you can miss if you just go through groups. Person level data, you'll be able to uh, find the people, hopefully, that aren't accessing digital services. And that goes hand in hand with better research and evaluation. That's something um, we at NHS England are looking at um, at the moment because a lot of organisations saying, well, how do we know we're digitally including people? How do we know? How do we measure it? And how do we measure the impact of that as well. So we're actually working on that with uh, several stakeholders at the moment. So dem dissemination of good practice is what we're looking at. As I said, the framework is not a mandate. It is not to tell you how to do things. It really is a direction of travel, what to consider. But we're at the moment as well in the other work that we're doing, it, we're disseminating good practice, areas that people have had difficult with, difficulty with and how they've overcome them. Um, so that's on a, on a, on a more local level. And in equity and program appraisals and um, impact assessments, we're looking at um, having digital inclusion included and how that can be best done um, legally within um, various frameworks. So um, those are the areas. And leadership and partnerships is always key. We always try to emphasize and support leadership and partnerships. So that's what we're doing at NHS England. I just want to finish now on the, um, 
And the onus really is on us. The people that are excluded don't often know they're excluded. And if they do, they're not going to put their hand up. I've worked in several areas where people don't declare that they've got a disability at work, even though it's in their interest to do so. I've worked, you know, people don't claim benefits are entitled to, even if it doesn't help them, uh, you know, if it's meant to help them. So we can't, we have, the onus really is on us. And that's why the emphasis is on a better evaluation research, including people. We can't wait for people to come forward and say actually I, I'm you know I'm here um, I'm not using your digital services we have to be pro proactive and raise awareness um, so I think just my last two points is that the policy direction actually comes from the government as well that the Health and Care Act of 2022 says that you have to consider digital inclusion and also reducing healthcare inequalities. And at NHS England, we have a particular priority, it's priority number two, that we have to mitigate against digital exclusion. So we've got a handle on this, but we, you know, we, we're, the framework is there and that's just a summary. And I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Katie. Brilliant, Karen. Thank you. Thanks for giving that fantastic overview. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, please go do go and take a look at the Framework for Action because it can be a really helpful tool at just framing the kind of activities that you might want to include as part of your work. OK, so you're lucky now that you've got me for the next 10 minutes. Uh, what I'm going to do is do, run through some uh, top tips and guidance in terms of how you might design your services. Um, so um, as part of the work of the uh, Voluntary and Community Sector Health and Wellbeing Alliance. Many organisations, like I mentioned earlier, have been doing digital inclusion uh, activities and projects. And as part of that, there's a number of us who have developed some top tips or helpful guidance that uh, kind of give you some ideas of things to work through. So one of the things I wanted to do was try and draw together some of those top tips for you. Um, here's some of the examples of those checklists and top tips. So if you are very much focused on a specific audience, then I would really encourage you to go and seek these out. Um, so you've got one from Bernardo's, one from Hospice UK. The middle one is uh, for people with uh, learning disabilities and our um, guidance on the right hand side as well. So but as we were, I was glancing across them, it was quite clear that there was some really simple and clear themes that were surfacing. Um, Take care, though, as I said at the beginning, to really explore your specific audience to understand whether any of these areas will be more important or more effective in, in engaging the populations you're trying to reach. So, broadly speaking, they're fairly the advice is fairly consistent um, and falls into four core areas. So, essentially, what we're talking about is initially audience, making sure you know who they are and bringing them into the process. Secondly, is uh, wrapping around support to your uh, uh, service, which I briefly mentioned before, but we'll talk about more. Thinking about the design of your product or service, your online products or service, and then also telling people about it as well. So let's look in a little bit more detail about what we mean about each of those things. Um, so audience, firstly, know your audience and their, their needs. There's lots of data out there. It might all not be perfect, but there is data that leads you in the right direction. If you're interested in some of the audiences represented by the uh, partners that we've been running this event with, for, with, I suggest you go back and either watch their sessions or um, connect with them directly. Know who is at the highest risk of exclusion. Do they need support with data and devices to get access, as Karen was saying, and understand their unique barriers. Make sure you're exploring that a little bit more. Design with them as well. Bring them into the process from the very beginning. For those of you who were here yesterday, um, we heard from Hospice UK about their rede redesign of their website and how they did that from the very beginning and how they felt that that had really enabled that design. Um, Co-design can be really helpful and, like I say, go to where they are. Don't expect them to join a Zoom call. Go and sit with them. Explore what their needs are. Spend some time um, understanding where digital is an issue within their lives and also explore what digital services they like using and why. There's lots you can learn from the services that do work for them. Finally, know who is missing. Um, so you might have designed an amazing digital uh, service, uh, an app or whatever it is, and it's up and running. But 
make sure you know who which the populations are that aren't using that service so continue to invite them in but also consider how else they're accessing your service if they're not accessing it through the uh, digital tool that you've put in place um, it's a it's a continuous improvement process it's constantly checking reviewing and developing um, now design so there's lots of existing standards and guidance out there that you can use so you're not starting from scratch. Consider an easy read format. Many people will benefit from having that format. Um, think about accessibility guidance and I'll touch on some of that uh, later. We've got a handy infographic that might be helpful. And then also think about the accessible information standard. It's also about the language you write in, you know, making sure that it is simple, clear, effective. Um, if you're writing at that level, then everybody can understand, even the most educated, but it brings in those that are more likely to be excluded. Um, use imagery and provide paper guidance. One of the things we hear a lot from people who are trying to access digital services is that they forget how to use it. And what they want is a simple reference guide that they can go back to on a regular basis. And for many people, that is a paper version. You know, it's something that they can have on their notice board, on the side that they know where they can go back to it time and time again. Um, that works for how to switch on your laptop as much as how to use this digital service and product. If you can replicate other products and services that are out there that they know how to use and are comfortable with using, I'd really suggest you look and think about doing that. Um, and then providing um, access and choice. So designing in multiple access points, don't force people to use digital, which is in the NHS guidance, you know, making sure that people still have multiple ways to access the, your products and services. So next is support. We've mentioned this a little bit. Um, think about who is providing frontline support that wraps around your digital product and service. I mentioned earlier the receptionist who's asked every time when somebody's trying to make an appointment, but I don't know how to do it. Can you show me? Have they got time to do that? Do they have the, their own skills to be able to do that? And can you train them to do that or create a role within your healthcare setting that, uh, that supports that? It's also worth considering the other organisations that are able to help with that, like voluntary and community sector organisations, but don't expect them to do that for free. They need to be able to, you know, keep themselves running in the same way. So think about how you're going to fund and support that. Um, and then also to make this really work, those people at bet who are best at helping people to use digital services are those that love it those that are enthusiastic about it and create a role for them. Give them a label of a digital champion and train them to do that. Many people who have learned to do it themselves also are quite keen to become buddies or a champion themselves. So it might be that it's a local volunteer, but just consider how you're going to make that work at a local level. And like I say, consider your networks. There are many voluntary and community sector organisations that can do that. There are other parts of NHS systems that might already have this set up that you can access. Um, consider how link workers and social prescribing can help with this as well. So just consider that whole package at a local level and how it's going to work. And then finally, communicate tell people about your new offer in lots of different ways you know you can pop it on a notice board you can send them a text message you can send them an email you can uh have uh people in this in your healthcare setting talking to people as they're coming in and explaining what it's going to be like and um, make sure there's a real mix of messages and build them into your existing customer journeys don't do something separate because there will, all, will always be new people coming into your service who need telling about how they how they can access your services and the multiple ways in which they can do that and allow them to make their own choices in terms of how they access. Continue to invite them in. So as Karen says, there are many people who may not see digital as for them. They might not be motivated and they might not see the reason why they should use an online service. It's important to keep asking people. Their confidence can change over time. Somebody might have bought them a tablet and all of a sudden they're able, they're, their horizons have opened for them. Um, so every time they try and make an appointment using uh, a te the telephone, you can ask them if they can use the digital service. But as soon as they tell you to stop asking, stop and make a rec record of that preference so you're not not badgering people who really have made that decision that it is never for them make it easy 
Um, make it easy to find your services. Think about the search terms. Make it easy for them to opt in or opt out. We know that today to find a telephone number for anything, the easiest way to do that is to do that online. How do people find out about your service if they're not digitally included? Give them multiple options to kind of find that route in. So part of that is about the communications plan and the channels that you're adopting, but also part of it is about putting yourself in the mindset of that individual who doesn't have that access point and how might they find their way in. So really simple, four core areas, the best for the best chance of success with digital inclusion. If you can focus on these four areas and consider how you're going to address them in the design of your service, it, it really is the most effective way at ensuring the best chance of success for your product or service. And that's it, which means I am a little ahead of time, which is always good in a session like this. If you have any questions about this, please do pop them in the chat. More than happy to answer them at the end. But also um, me and uh, my colleagues at Good Things Foundation. So on the call with me today, I've got Joe, Meg and Emma. Be only too happy to talk with you more about this. It's, this is the kind of stuff we do every day and see every day. And we're more than happy to give you more research and more evidence on the back of this. Okie doke. So our next two speakers are going to help us shine a spotlight on virtual wards. So many of you will know virtual wards are uh, have been a big uh, project for the NHS over the last few years, moving services into more of a virtual environment where people may be able to stay at home and access services in a different way using digital tools and services. So I'm really pleased to introduce John uh, from, uh, from Carers UK, had a mind block then sorry John um to, who's going to talk through um their experience of exploring digital exclusion and virtual wards and then following John Leo um is going to come in uh and talk a little bit more about some more research that he's done as well so John if you're there can I hand over to you you can indeed Katie um thanks John thank you very much and I'm delighted to be here so thank you very much Katie and team um for inviting us to speak today um to you all about um, care with digital exclusion and virtual wards. As Katie said, uh, my name is John Perryman and I'm the Policy Public Affairs Manager at Carers UK. We are a membership charity that um, was established about 60 years ago to represent the needs of family and friends who are caring for loved ones. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit, a little bit about us. Um, next slide, please. So today, firstly, I wanted to just touch quickly on carers and digital exclusion before we dive more deeply into uh, carers' experience of, of virtual wards. Um, I think firstly, it's important to, to outline who, 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 what we mean by carers, um, in case anyone isn't clear. For us, unpaid carers are people who provide carers for, as I said, to family members or friends who have disabilities, chronic illnesses, or who are elderly. And many of them often face challenges related to digital exclusion, um, especially, especially older carers, as um, you won't be surprised to hear. That digital exclusion um, can impact on people's lives in a, in a variety of different ways, including access to information and support services. That can lead people to, um, to feel really isolated and um, due to a lack of connectivity. Um, it can impact their ability to access benefits and financial support, and also their, their ability to manage administrative tasks. Um, we think it's really crucial that there's a spotlight shone on the digital exclusion that carers face um, to ensure that they have equal access to information, support and the resources necessary um, to support their well-being and the well-being of those that they care for. Um, last year, we produced a good practice briefing, which specifically focused on older carers and digital exclusion, which I've linked to in the resources, um, and I think which is going to be shared um, following the session. Um, I did just want to highlight the quote that I've got, got up on the screen to, um, you know, to really hammer home the point that this is a, it, you know, it can be a really deeply challenging um, area for people. Um, so I won't read the quote out, but it's, it's there for people, people to see. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as part of Carers UK's work through the Carers Partnership, which um, we, we run with Carers Trust through the Health and Wellbeing Alliance, um, we wanted to have a focus on the, the experiences of unpaid carers when they interact with, with virtual wards. As Katie said, the virtual wards programme is something that's um, expanded rapidly um, since the pandemic. Um, and um, yeah, it's something that we really thought was a, it was important for us to focus on. 
for those who aren't aware of what virtual wards are, virtual wards are an alternative to NHS medical care that's enabled by technology. Um, it supports patients who would otherwise be in hospital to receive um, acute short-term care, often up to you know a maximum of 14 days in their own home um, with monitoring and tr treatment available. Um, the, the purpose is to basically prevent avoidable admissions into hospitals or the early discharge out of hospital. Um, for some people, it may be, uh, in some areas, it might be called something other than a virtual board, um, for example, hospital at home. Next slide, please. The reason we wanted to have a focus on, on virtual wards is whilst for many patients and carers um, who we've spoken to, they've told us that it can be an extremely positive experience, we had concerns that if the right support wasn't in place, it could pose potential, the, the delivery of virtual wards could, could pose potential risks for carers. It may, for example, result in people having to pick up significant additional caring responsibilities that impact on their lives. Um, it, and if people aren't identified as carers um, in the process of someone being discharged onto a virtual ward, um, could really impact upon, upon their lives. As I said, we think there is real benefits to this to this program for carers and those that they care for. People want to stay at home, they want to get the, the, the care that they need at home. Um, but yeah, we wanted to mitigate against some of the potential risks that people might face. Um, we're really pleased that you know the NHS um, and health services recognise that they have a responsibility to involve carers where appropriate in the care of the person that they're looking after. Um, and carers are able to decline, um, carers and, and patients are able to decline being looked after on a virtual ward if, if they don't think it's right for them. Next slide, please. As I said, the um, NHS England guidance, which we've again linked to in the, um, in, in the, in the slides, is called Enables, Enablers of Success. Um, and it does really helpfully outline the, the virtual wars and when they're being delivered, must consider the needs of carers. Specifically, they need to recognise carers as equal partners in care, include carers in all aspects of virtual ward care, from discharge planning and support, um, to whether the person with care and support needs should remain in a virtual ward if, the, if their situation changes. They must respect carers' wishes in terms of the aspects of care they are able and willing to provide, if any. As I said, carers are able to, to say that they don't think it's it's the right thing for them and that it's unmanageable. Um, those living virtual wards must make carers aware of their rights under the various pieces of legislation that exist, including the um, Health and Care Act that was passed in 2022, and also ensure that carers have access to information about what to do if they're no, not, no longer able to provide care on a virtual ward, if the person that they're caring for, if their needs have worsened, um, et cetera. Next slide, please. So why involve and support and paid carers in virtual wards? Firstly, it recognises who is doing the, the, the vast majority of caring day in and day out. It helps to get care decisions right the first time, reduces readmissions to hospital. Um, we've heard of countless cases where um, people have been discharged from hospital. Um, it wasn't the right decision to make, and that just results in people returning to hospital, making it much more difficult for professionals, the patient and the family or, or carers who are looking after them. It can, it can help to avoid emergency care situations, um, improve the outcomes of people needing care and protect and support carers' own health and well-being. It can also help carers to continue to juggle paid work alongside their own paid care and um, responsibilities by giving them choices. Some carers who um, we've spoken to who weren't consulted and involved in the decision to discharge the person they care for onto a virtual ward have talked to us about the, the huge impact that not being involved had on their life. Um, and in certain situations, people have had to give up their own, their, give up give up work essentially because of the additional care responsibilities that it placed, up, placed on them. Um, and finally, it also supports positive relationships with staff working in the NHS and social care. Next slide, please. Um, one carer, Norman, um, who cares for cares for his his wife, who, who's experienced multiple hospital discharge charges, talked about the talked about this to us, and I, again wanted to share his testimony with you. 
Um, he said, when care is involved, you essentially know how it's going to go. If you're treated as part of the team and your knowledge is utilised, you know you're going to have a better experience. If you are treated as a, as a real pain or a problem, you know it's going to be really awful. I think that just really underlines the importance of making sure that people are aware of what's going on, that they feel consulted, involved, um, and part of the expert team that's going to be looking after um, the person that needs care. Next slide, please. We also, you know, um, I, I won't read through all these quotes, but through our state of caring survey, which was responded to by over 11,000 carers um, last year, we asked a question about the, um, people's experiences of virtual wars and the testimonies that they shared with us were really, really um, invaluable. Um, and it did, it did, whilst I said earlier that, um, you know, carers are, are mainly positive about their experiences, I think it's just really important to say that when it, when they aren't positive experiences, they can be um, really life-altering and really impactful in a negative way. Um, so yeah, I, I think the, the one of the, the quote in the top left corner is the one that I was talking about previously, um, and really emphasises the fact that people should be um, should those decisions should be made in consultation with family and friends who are caring for people. Next slide, please, Katie. So finally, I just wanted to share with you some of the resources that we've been developing over the last couple of years um, to help support carers and professionals um, who are delivering virtual wards to really think about um, involving carers in the delivery of, uh, of virtual wards. Firstly, we've produced a template leaflet for paid carers, um, which local stakeholders can tailor for themselves to help people understand how the virtual wards work in your local areas. Um, so, that, so that carers understand what they are. We've also literally this week um, published a policy explainer which provides more details about the function of the virtual wards. Um, it's designed for local organisations and carers so that they understand um, what a virtual ward means, what carers' legal duties are, oh, sorry, what the NHS's legal duties towards carers are and what carers' rights are um, uh, when, when interacting with the NHS. We've also produced an advocacy guide, um, which is intended to give carers confidence about how they interact with virtual wards. It has a checklist of questions that people are encouraged to ask when the person that they care for is discharged onto a, onto a virtual ward, which was um, co-produced with, with some of the carers that we work with. We're also in the process of developing a professional checklist and a carer pathway, which will help um, care professionals to, to really think in detail about the needs of carers um, when they're, when they're asking people to be discharged onto virtual wards. So I think that's everything for me, but if you have any um, questions about the work that we're doing or the role um, that unpaid carers need to play in the, in the rollout of the, the wider rollout of virtual wards by the NHS, uh, please do feel free to, to, to get in touch and contact us. Thank you, Katie. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Really, really great uh, session. Thanks very much and a really good overview of how uh, carers are interacting with virtual wards. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to hand over to Leo now from British Red Cross, who is also going to talk about the work that they've been doing on virtual wards and uh, the overlap with health inequalities and digital exclusion. Leo, over to you. Thanks very much, Katie, and, Thank and thanks very much for the invitation today uh, to present. Uh, and thanks also, John, for, for that previous presentation, which gave a really great introduction to virtual wards and touched on themes in far greater depth on carers um, that, uh, that were echoed in some of our findings as well. Um, so my name's Leo Bryant. I'm Policy and Advocacy Manager at British Red Cross. Uh, and I'm going to present our Health Inequalities and Virtual Wards uh, project, with a, a meet, which is um, funded and supported by the Health and Wellbeing Alliance. Uh, with an immediate proviso that these are provisional findings because the uh, the project is uh, still in process. Um, and so, it, in fact, your reflections uh, and questions uh, on our findings would be really helpful in helping us to uh, uh, complete the project, um, which I will go into more detail on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so quick overview of the project. Um, so the inception of the project came from uh, our reflection that virtual wards are being rolled out at scale, pace, uh, and widely across the UK with a um, widespread perception that they confer 
a range of really positive benefits to patients, including um, reducing the negative uh, impact of hospitalisation, uh, reducing the cost of accessing hospitals, uh, and, and you know a number of these can have real benefits for reducing health inequalities. But nevertheless, there seems to be a gap in the literature uh, really interrogating uh, these hopeful assumptions um, and also looking in depth at what some of the challenges might be for virtual wards um, on uh, uh, with regard to health inequalities. So our aim was to, uh, to scope the expertise uh, of the um, Health and Wellbeing Alliance partner members uh, on inequalities in order to identify uh, issues related to health inequality that, that would be worthy of further investigation and follow up um, with future research on this important topic. Um, next slide, please. Um, so project overview. Um, the real focus of the project um, is uh, was the workshop that we held uh, right at the end of November um, with uh, VCS professionals with expertise uh, in one or more areas of health inequality uh, and or lived experience um, of health inequality. Uh, and we asked um, around 60 participants uh, to, having introduced how um, virtual wards work, to feedback on where they think barriers to access might be um, and uh, to, to, to think on potential solutions for addressing those. Prior to the workshop, we also did a literature review uh, and survey, uh, a, an online survey of VCS members of the Alliance uh, and group interviews with virtual ward clinicians uh, from five different clinical teams. Uh, and we're currently in the uh, uh, recording review of recordings and notes from the workshop and writing up the findings phase uh, for a, a product that we will be uh, making widely available uh, when the project's complete. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, oh, this slide's uh, not come out how I thought it would, but um, so I'll just talk quickly. Sorry, on that's this. transfer from PowerPoint to Google Slides. Apologies for that. I thought. I'd yeah, no problem. problem. <laughs> it happens. Um, so, yeah, barriers to access were a key uh, uh, a key theme here. Both barriers to actual enrolment in a ward, but also barriers to the quality of experience uh, within a ward. Um, so, uh, yeah, obviously, barriers to access that came up might include uh, patients with additional complex, multiple uh, physical or mental health needs. Environmental barriers, um, particularly focused on the home environment. So some homes might just not be well suited for, uh, for virtual wards, particularly uh, in low income environments uh, where there might be an increased chance of mold or damp uh, or insufficient ventilation, because uh, we know Lots of um, virtual wards are focused on respiratory tract and, uh, treatment for respiratory tract uh, infection and disease. Um, phone, broadband, mobile coverage, as has been already mentioned previously, um, and uh, uh, money to pay for things like adequate nutrition and heating uh, while on a virtual ward. Next slide, please. Um, so we've identified um, uh, points that came up from the workshop and previous discussions into five different themes. Um, the first of these is communication challenges, which, is, which has come up already today. Uh, I'll just touch on this very briefly, but there's a sense that there was a sense uh, that virtual wards are not always well understood uh, by communities and that this can affect uptake. Um, so for example, a fear that the agenda is really about cutting costs rather than improving patient experience. Uh, and if you just do the next pop-up. Um, Casey, thanks. Um, so, um, and, and, and the need to focus on um, clearer and more comprehensive communication to communities with a potential role for uh, working with grassroots uh, community organizations and groups uh, to relay that information to um, vulnerable groups who need it the most. Next slide, please. Um, trust and safety was another key theme, uh, and I suppose there's uh, the, the the key focus areas here are about concern for people who are vulnerable. Um, you know, the 
especially with lots of um, virtual ward patients being elderly, um, being in a situation where they're letting people they don't know or recognise into their home on a regular basis. But also concerns about what it might mean to lose the safe haven uh, benefits of a hospital for some groups, such as uh, domestic abuse victims, those on low income, uh, and, and indeed the, the respite that hospital might offer to, to unpaid carers at home. Uh, and finally, concerns about um, healthcare providers respecting cultural values inside the home. Um, so solutions to explore here uh, focused on the need for healthcare providers to get specialist education and training to address some of these concerns, uh, to help develop a trauma-informed approach uh, for healthcare providers to ensure that patients always know who's coming to the house, why, that they're identified with a badge, etc. cetera. Uh, and they're also they're trained and supported uh, on safeguarding so that we can use virtual wards as an opportunity uh, for, for better social care, to, to spot signs of distress or abuse uh, and to know what to do about those. Uh, next slide, please. Um, well, yeah, John's already done a terrific job in much greater depth, but just to add that, you know, social care and, and the perspective of unpaid carers really came up uh, as a priority theme in the workshop. Um, so yeah, e echoing the um, recommendation that uh, unpaid carers need to be brought in. Um, uh, sorry, next, if you just tap on the next one, Katie, uh, and involved in decision-making, um, but also that where questions were asked about how virtual wards are going to interact uh, with social care provision uh, and uh, the need for guidance to social care providers um, on, on how, how to interact with virtual wards. Next slide, please. Um, so as I said earlier, the home environment has also, has also uh, identified as full of potential barriers to access and quality of experience. Uh, this could range from the home uh, not having the right infrastructure, uh, perhaps no bed on the ground floor, having an inaccessible bathroom, um, or perhaps not being sufficiently heated, ventilated, and uh, dangers of mould. Um, and then also looking at what that might mean for people with issues related to homelessness um, or people who might be vulnerable to being moved on from their current accommodation at short notice, such as asylum seekers um, and solutions, please, Katie. Thanks. Um, so this was a, an area that was really flagged for more, uh, you know, further research uh, uh, and investigation. But it was flagged that there's lots of um, relevant learning already out there uh, from other models such as hospice and at home um, and care that's already available for older people through television prompts etc. Uh, next slide please. Uh, digital and tech barriers was another major theme of discussion. Um, so particular concerns about what happens if connection is lost uh, when something goes wrong uh, whether people in rural areas are going to be able to enjoy access to virtual wards, um, need for reassurance about what's happening to personal health data uh, used through virtual wards uh, and language barriers. Next slide, please. And I'm sure Katie and Joe will be delighted to hear that the expertise of Good Things Foundation was flagged as a, a potential go-to solution on, on this topic. So, uh, yeah, just to uh, uh, big up the resources that uh, Katie uh, presented to us earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so reflections on, on, on the workshop uh, discussions and uh, on the other elements uh, to this pro project. Um, there's, there's, you know, it's, they, they point to a need for appropriate support to go alongside or to virtual ward programs uh, to support uh, their efforts in, in tackling health inequalities. Uh, particularly around availability of support for carers, uh, for addressing issues with living conditions, um, and, uh, and also thinking through how uh, virtual wards might work with people living in temporary accommodation uh, and on staff training. Echoing also Karen's initial call for uh, the need for more data and evidence to better understand uh, options and outcomes for different groups. Um, and finally, 
um, I suppose, this broad question on how can virtual ward programmes provide or best operate alongside additional support to patients and carriers to address inequality barriers um, listed below there uh, and and what what role for uh, BCS organisations um, to, to best enable that. Um, so a, a, a call for partnership at the end. Um, how have I done for time? I hope that hasn't gone over too much. Brilliant. We know we're okay. Yeah. We're we're keeping Great. an eye on time. We would have in, uh, interrupted you if we needed you to speed up. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thanks, John, for that. That's a really great overview. If you have loads any questions about virtual worlds, there's lots more we can talk about um, definitely in the chat later around how uh, digital plays a role. We've got some uh, examples from some of the work we've been doing at Good Things as well, so um, we can play those in. Uh, so, last but not least. I'm delighted to introduce Grace Murray, who is from South Tees NHS Foundation Trust. She is their digital midwife. Um, and so she's going to talk briefly about how she's been, uh, how, the digital exclusion she's observed amongst uh, the community she supports and how, what they've been able to do about it. Grace, are you there? Hello, yes I am. Brilliant, thank, thank you, you for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm Grace, I'm the digital midwife at South Tees, which means that I um, support digital transformation within the maternity services in a nutshell. Um, we just go on the next slide, please. So I'll give a little bit of a background into the project that I've been doing, but I've been asked to present it more of a case study. I'm not going to go over the things that everybody else has already talked about, because I think we all understand a little bit more around what digital exclusion means. Um, but I was tasked with the job of implementing an electronic record, and there was lots of national drivers that, that supported this. So um, the idea came from the Better Births Report way back in 2016, and um, they set out what they said was a clear vision um, for maternity services to become safer, more personalised, kinder, professional, more family-friendly, family, family friendly, and that by 2023-24, that all women, all women should be able to access the maternity roads, uh, notes and information through the smartphone or an app, um, which sounds really simple. And I think that that's exactly what um, Karen was talking about earlier on, that we we have lots of senior decision makers that say, put this digital system in and it will make all of these improvements and it doesn't make all of them improvements for everybody. And it was something that I was really, really conscious about. Um, so because I wanted to execute the project well, I, want, I could see all the benefits that digital transformation would bring to maternity services. Um, but I was also still a mid, you know, I'm still a midwife at heart. I've got all of that clinical experience and I was, couldn't get out of my head. What about the women that don't have access to a phone, don't have access to the internet or can't use it, don't speak English, for example. Um, and I searched and searched and I didn't really find an awful lot. There wasn't anything locally um, from our kind of council government that, that we would be able to offer women as a substitute. Um, and it seemed that the only other alternative was to give them paper notes, which I still didn't feel... Um, you know, was a reasonable substitution to just leave them out. Um, so I thought if we want to make this change happen, we have to make it happen for all of the women that we provide services to, not just for those that can either afford it or um, those who've got access, basically. Um, so if you pop onto my next slide, please. Um, so exactly how Karen said, digital exclusion, what it looks like within our service, it's um, having the access to the internet um, and to a device having the skills to be able to navigate through them, different apps, websites, information that we send to the women, having the confidence to be able to do that and the motivation. So, you know, we are quite lucky in the fact that we've got quite a, a young, healthy population, but not everybody sees that um, using the internet for healthcare is always helpful. Um, our maternity services do facilitate around 5,000 births a year. And I think I was quite surprised to realise how many of those women that we book each month are from the most deprived areas. So we book up to 38% of women from the most deprived postcode um, based on the IMD set, uh, time. So that seemed like a, like a real high risk for me to put in a digital system without offering them any substitute. Um, we've also got quite a, a large percentage of women that don't speak English. If you can go on to my next slide, please. Um, so this is just a little bit around what we've done, and we I can pop the um, link to the case study into the chat if anybody wants to look at it in a little bit more detail, because I'm conscious I've only got five minutes. 
Um, so what we did was uh, I reached out to any local charities that were in the area, any non-for-profit organisations, and found um, a lovely charity called the Hope Foundation. It's very local to our hospital. Um, they've set up um, a system called Thurbed IT, whereby you can become a drop-off and distributor of devices. The actual Hope um, Foundation's also got a device library where you can rent a device just the same as you can rent a phone. So I absolutely capitalised on that and made partners with them. So we're now um, a distributor of devices um, and I just request them as, as frequently as I need to give to the women. Um, it was actually the Hope Foundation that put me onto the Good Things Foundation, which was amazing. It was one of the best things that we ever did. Um, and we set up um, a maternity hub to be able to distribute SIM cards. So often I hand out the device with the SIM card um, alongside it. Um, I also partnered with another local non-for-profit organisation called Hartley Power. So they've been taking um, like the next step almost in looking at broadband for homes. Um, and they provided me with a, with, with a large number of free routers, which I can use the SIM cards from the Good, Foundation, uh, the Good Things Foundation in the routers and provide broadband for people at home as well. Um, and I think that this is obviously only the first steps really, but I didn't realise how maybe as far ahead we were in terms of other maternity services. Um, so when I started speaking about this to other people and asked them what they did, they do just give women paper notes or the women are excluded, which I found quite shocking, um, which has meant that the, obviously our whole region, all the, all the maternity services in our region are trying to use it as almost as a little bit of a blueprint and say, how can we put this into our trust? How can we make things better? Um, and it actually... The National Digital Midwife um, has, has set up like a bit of a rolling program so that um, every single maternity trust in the whole of the UK will be signed up to the Good Things Foundation by June, which is a brilliant step forward. Um, we've definitely got other work to do. I'm very, very conscious that at the minute we rely on the midwives for the digital skills development for the for the women and for the, um, and for themselves really i think you know sometimes we lose sight that some of our staff might actually be digitally excluded um so i've just recently put in um a funding bid through the vcma projects and um i've proposed that we, we implement two new roles one of them would be a digital skills development officer for the staff yeah. And the other one would be okay. a digital skills development officer for the patients and the families. Um, so having somebody who is available to say, can you navigate this? Oh no, we've lost you, Grace. Did you accidentally switch your Sorry. Oh, there you go. I yeah, <laughs> I didn't even touch, I didn't even touch anything. But did, I'm not sure where where I got to. Did you hear about the funding? Uh, well, yes, you were talking about the funding. Yeah. So the, two the roles. Next, yeah. yeah, the next step, two roles. One would be digital skills development officer for the staff, um, and the other one would be for the women. So somebody who can kind of sit and engage with the patients and say, do you know how to navigate the app? But even more basic skills, do you know how to switch this device on? Can I help you connect it to the internet? Um, do you know how to make a call? Because we, you know, one of our most frequently used phrases in maternity is if you've got any problems, oh, ring the yeah. advice line. But sometimes the women can't ring the advice line, either they can't communicate the um, or they don't know how to get in touch with us. I'm going to leave it there because someone's having a telephone conversation behind me and um, <laughs> I think I'm about finished. Is that okay. all right? Brilliant. Yeah, some really fantastic examples there, uh, Grace, and I'm really pleased you were able to come along and share some of that with us. And thanks so much for the hundreds of name checks you gave us there. And uh, uh, I promise everybody that we haven't been paying people to do that more. Um, fantastic. But we our offer is great. And if you want to access it, please do come and talk to us. <laughs> so there's Grace's contact details. Um, so uh, just a a couple more slides from me and then we'll kind of launch into questions so one of our other projects as part of the uh, work with the Health and Wellbeing Alliance was um, looking at accessibility standards and how we could learn from lots of the standards that are out there and simplify them and gather them together for some of our other voluntary and community partners to um, to use now um, as part of this work we've basically gathered things into kind of five core principles in terms of uh, helping people to um, make sure that their products and services that they produce as part of the Alliance are as accessible as they can be for all. Um, the five principles are detailed there and I won't spend a huge amount of time talking about them, but essentially we've, we've committed to make things easy to read, short, snappy, um, that the font size we use in our, our communications is of a certain size, we use inclusive language as best practice, um, we use image descriptions and alt text where we can, and we organize meetings and activities 
far ahead of time and check people's requirements before they come um, to attend them. Now, the these are really basic principles and you might be looking at them and think, well, of course, but it's so easy to forget if you're under pressure, putting stuff into place, trying to design a new uh, digital service. Just checking in on some of these principles is always useful um, to remind yourself of. Um, you can access more of this guidance on our website. Um, the link is there and uh, like I said, the slides will be available. There's much more detail behind each of those five principles, um, a little bit more explanation of the how you might do that. Um, but I just wanted to signpost people to them so that you knew that they were there. They are designed for voluntary and community organisations to make them really simple and easy to access. So if you are struggling to wade through some of the accessibility guidance out there, they are a good place to start. But it's standing on the shoulders of others. It's using their knowledge and skills and collating that rather than developing anything ourselves. So having signposted towards that, um, I just wanted to summarise what we've heard today before we launch into questions. So we've been very much focused on de designing inclusive uh, digital healthcare services, which is what all three of the seminars have been focused on. But today we've heard that um, how important thinking about your audience is, uh, is and building in support at that frontline rollout stage. So Grace talked about some of those um, kind of uh, her midwives doing that support at the moment and the roles that she's putting in place. And we heard from Carers UK and British Red Cross, the importance of thinking that through, bringing people along with you and making sure that design is thought about. Um, using data and knowledge to understand the extent of digital inclusion and exclusion and who it affects can help you target the support more appropriately. There is lots of data out there. It isn't perfect. And sometimes you have to use your best proxy. Um, we um, often use uh, Good Things Foundation, the index of multiple deprivation. There is high crossover in, in, in terms of the most deprived areas digital exclusion that is the simplest place to start in terms of data but obviously really understanding the specific needs of your audiences especially if you're targeting certain subgroups who have health inequalities as well then is definitely worth um, the effort and uh, you know data collection activities should you need to do it and then finally learn from others and build on their understanding there is so much good stuff out there you don't need to start from scratch with your design and also we heard yesterday how confusing it can be if people get used to one version of an online app like their GP surgery app and then they jump to um, maybe using hospice care or whatever it is where the app that they use or the virtual wards where the app that they use to access that is very different, looks very different, feels very different and all of a sudden the confidence that somebody had from using the GP app drops right back. So think about how you can build in consistency and similarities between systems to help people use them as much as possible. Okay, deep breath from me. Uh, we'll move on to the Q&A. So Jo has been monitoring the chat panel for us and I'm sure she's got some questions for us. While we do that, I'm just going to put people's contact details on the screen. If we don't get to your to your question and you would like to talk more to any of our colleagues that have been here today, um, there, there are their contact details. So please do feel free to do that should you wish to. Jo. Great. Thank you very much, Katie. And thanks for all of the comments and reflections and questions in the chat. There's been lots of really interesting stuff um, to read through there. Uh, so th the question of data and, and capturing data on who is and isn't visually um, included uh, in relation to a service has cropped up. And this has been a, a sort of a theme from what we've heard today. Um, first part of the question, I think, is is something around how how can we actually collect data on who is not using a digital service, who is excluded from that service, and um, particularly when the people who might be most excluded are also um, uh, might be excluded more socially um, or in other ways as well. So it might be more difficult for people to reach and to, uh, for want of a better word, in, more invisible to a service. So um, maybe I'll pitch that question perhaps to John first. Maybe Leo might want to follow up possibly Grace as well. How do you capture data on those people who are excluded and who are perhaps more invisible to a service? Thanks, Jo. Um, I mean, because of the nature of our organisation, I would say probably the the primary way that we do that is through the survey we do of our membership on a yearly basis where we, um, it's called our state of caring survey. As I, as I mentioned in my presentation last year, we had over 11,000 carers respond to that, which was, um, you know, gives us a really uh, interesting insight into their lives. One of the questions we sometimes ask on a yearly basis is around um, access to services, um, 
digital exclusion and things like that. So that's probably the primary way that we as an organization capture that data and understand um, where carers are at um, across the population in terms of in, in, ter in terms of those sorts of issues. Um, as I mentioned, we did produce a guide based on that data um, last year, looking specifically at older carers, um, older carers and digital exclusion, which I can put into the chat in a second, um, a link to. But um, yeah, that's probably probably the main way that we do that. That's great. And John, can I ask you a follow up, slightly cheeky question? How do you administer your survey? Is it an online survey? <laughs> it's an online survey, although we um, we do also. Um, have communications that go out in our postal okay. membership um, newsletters, which whereby people can request a paper survey that they can fill in, and we do get requests from carers to do that. Sure, that's great. Yes, it's it's one of the things that we we're thinking about at Good Things as well. The ways we can better capture um, data from people who might not want to be completing an online survey. That's yeah. great. Um, thank you, uh, Leo. Anything to add from your perspective? Um. Yeah, only that. Um, so our our uh, operational, um, the operational side of our organisation has done some research into digital uh, accessibility of, um, of you know of of the technology in, in virtual wards, um, and has broadly found uh, that you know a lot of a lot of good effort in making it as simple as and accessible as possible has you know has paid dividends and that. Uh, you know, lots of people who say they struggle with the internet found the devices quite, uh, you know, relatively easy to use, which is which is positive. Um, yeah, we we don't yeah we we don't have a an ongoing digital uh, service, so it's not it's not a um, something we we do regular research on. Um, but I think the findings from our uh, our workshop have have flagged that there are lots of vulnerable groups out there who. Uh, for whom this will be an issue um, and, and has really just highlighted the need for more research and, and data on who they are and, and, and what the, um, I suppose, what the pain points are on, on their journey, uh, um, either in a virtual ward or to accessing one. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Leo. Um, and, and Grace, how about with, with the women that you support? How do you get somebody to, as Karen said earlier, people are often going to put their hand up and say, by the way, I'm digitally excluded. How do you capture that information and understand who's, who might need extra support? Oh, we might have lost Grace. I think, she, did she have to leave early? I think that's probably the case. I remember that, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, um, uh, I, I might, we've got Emma Stone from Good Things here. I might just um, pop that question. I know, Emma, you responded to, to something in the chat. Do you want to just expand a little bit on on some of the tools that um, that might be available for services to use to explore um, digital needs and, and um, equality assessments? Yeah, um, so there are um, a couple of a couple of tools. So one um, has been developed by NHS uh, Cheshire and Merseyside and another one, the Digital Exclusion Risk Index developed by GMCA. Uh, and that, uh, as, as Katie was talking earlier, that also draws on the index of multiple deprivation in England and then separate ones um, in Scotland, for example, and Wales. So although that's been developed in Greater Manchester, actually the tool itself has been expanded to cover the whole of the UK. And what what that would help with is being able to identify local areas where the risks of digital exclusion will be higher. So that's quite helpful at a strategic place-based way. But I think some of the questions from the chat are actually in terms of your own community of service users. And so I think, you know, one of the things there is to think about how are you already gathering data? There's a particular flag in terms of that transition to going, let's, you know, making an assumption about let's gather data through online channels only, which, which you know, is clearly, as we've all, all identified, is a really flawed assumption, especially when you're talking about people who are users of health or care um, and who may also be from inclusion health groups, for example. Um, so there is something about thinking about what you already do, understanding people, people's communication preferences as well can be helpful in that. But of course, the other complication here is that people aren't either exclude, most people who face barriers are not entirely offline. They may have some level of access, 
but it may not be sufficient. They may be able to use um, the internet for certain things, but don't want to or struggle to use it for other things, including accessing health services. So again, that's another, that is another element that makes it complicated here in terms of the, the how you're using. And so again, as with anything, it's about how do you plan to, to use the data? What is the information and what is it gonna tell you um, uh, that would then shape your offer and the support you provide? So I think, it, the data thing is a massive issue but in terms of working out you know the starting point is what what is the purpose of this how are you going to use it what are you already doing and just being really conscious of the fact that we cannot now assume that um doing things online uh is going to work for everyone because it clearly isn't great thank you emma and um, there were um uh, a few points in the chat as well around the, the role of of community based organizations um, in supporting people to access um, services online and and we um, in a number of presentations uh, today and in previous seminars people have identified the, the really valuable role of a trusted local level face-to-face -face support that where somebody can help um, provide that support to somebody to get online or to use an app or to, to connect for a, a video consultation or whatever it is. Um, the question came from the chat. Uh, what about funding for this community level support? It's really valuable, but um, it needs funding. It needs supporting. So I might pose that question to Karen um, from a sort of strategic level. What is there? Or what should there be available to support what we know is a really, really valuable resource um, to enable people to engage better with digital? Am I here? Yeah, I am here. You are, yeah, um, yeah. We're actually looking at funding at the moment for uh, the next financial year, how we could support various partnerships, because we identify that, you know, cost is, is an issue when it comes to digital. And for the people that are actually really good at engaging with various excluded communities, have less of the, the, the you know, the financial resources. So we're actually, we, this is a discussion that's being had now. We're actually talking about it um, and hopefully may have, you know, I'm not going to promise anything here, but um, it, we may have some uh, funding available possibly. Um, um, also, we do have accelerator groups, and for anyone that uh, doesn't know, we do have people in the in the NHS that engage with volunteers that engage with members of excluded communities, um, and they've been very effective uh, at particularly around the pandemic when we had people vaccine hesitancy and, you know, they weren't going to listen to, you know, the, the, the usual kind of authoritative um, sort of speakers, I suppose, and stakeholders. So we do make use, we do value absolutely um, various community groups. So to answer your question, we understand and we want to facilitate funding um, for various uh, community engaged, if we have to do this properly and successfully, it's it's a consideration we have. That's great. Thank you, Karen. Good to hear. What's the space? Um, Leo or John, anything to add on on how you kind of navigate the relationships to um, and and find the re the resources um, to to be able to support people to engage with digitally. Jump in if you've got any. Go ahead, John. I'm not, I was going to let Leo go first, but um, I mean, from our perspective. Lo local carers organisations that exist across the country do a fantastic job in supporting their local populations um, and they kind of you know are on the ground and know best how to engage with the people that they interact with in that community but um, yeah we have a tool on our, on our website which directs people to local support so I, I would suggest that that's what people would explore. Great. Leo anything to add? Well yeah I, I think just to add that you know when Looking at the social care needs together with the uh, digital access barriers uh, in the context of the scale that virtual wards are, are, are expanding in, there, there's a need for, for this extra support at scale. Uh, and it's, you know, I, just to really say, I, I think there's a case for ICS is looking at this as a, a, a you know, a, as a scale based challenge on how to increase uh this kind of in, in home support to complement um the growth of um healthcare services at home 
I was just going to I was just yeah, going to come in and talk about uh, Good Things Foundation grants program as well. So we've got a number of different grants that are available to help organisations set up their digital inclusion services at a local level. These are at kind of uh, kind of in incremental levels, you know, a capability. Uh, uh, an activation grant for you to get started, a capability grant to get you a little bit further along that journey and an impact gr grant to help you do even more along that journey. They're small amounts, but if you're a small local community organization that are really passionate about this stuff, I would definitely encourage you to explore that a little bit further. It might help you buy a little bit more technology, fund a little bit of a volunteer's time or, or a role um, just to make, get some of this stuff up and running. It can be really helpful. Great, thank you, Katie. Good plug. Um, and just in, in the final few minutes, um, there was um, there are a couple of comments about about when digital services are taken away. So an example from um, I think from Lincolnshire, where uh, access to booking GP appointments online has been removed from a number of GP sur surgeries in one area. Um, I know it's a frustration I have that I can't. Uh, uh, my GP surgery is taken away. What what used to be quite easy to book online services and now isn't far more complicated and it isn't connected to the my gp app um what what do we do there what why might this be happening and, and how can we mitigate that especially when it comes to confidence and trust in services if things are constantly changing and even potentially going backwards um who would like to take that karen maybe i'll come to you with that tricky one I think communication has a lot to do with it. I mean, a similar thing's happened to me, actually. I've just gone online and it's like, well, I haven't used this before. What's going on here? And uh, it was, I think if it was communicated better, why have you changed? Um, it's not because we don't want to see you. We're not interested in you anymore. Um, but it did feel like it'd been filtered. Like there's, there's like a blockage, an extra hurdle to get through. Um, so I think communication is uh, particularly important. Um, and because, like I said, digital, digital literacy, you can't assume people know about updates. You can't assume people know all this stuff. They only want to get to a service. Um, they're not digital experts. So I think communication is very important. Why has this happened? And explain it um, that it's not actually about we don't you know, we don't want to be near you anymore. We're not distancing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, any other replies, Katie? Yeah. I think this just massively le leans into those uh, design principles that we talked about earlier. So for me, a kind of knee jerk, oh, we're going to stop doing online services feels like they've had a few complaints and they're worried about excluding people from their service. So they said, right, we'll stop. We'll go back to the old way of doing it. If they had taken their time to set up their service, done proper consultation and communication design and thought it through, they might not have got to that point. You would hope they hadn't, but you know, there is always the chance. Um, and so for me, I think they perhaps got frightened. If they'd pushed too far, too fast, too quickly with their populations. Um, it would be nice if they had some form of support network like, uh, digital inclusion network across their local I don't know NHS systems that will give them the support and the confidence to continue down that route and give them ideas of how they might address or bring think people along with them if they are kind of facing these blockages or barriers um, but they don't they they do exist in pockets there are some fantastic examples of that happening but not everywhere and maybe that's you know is something that that local population might be able to think about um, in terms of how you can stop that happening in the future. Thanks, Katie. And I think that it also um, speaks to the point that we've heard several times today and, and in previous seminars as well about the importance of bringing staff along and the digital inclusion journey as well, that staff confidence and motivation and time and capacity to engage when somebody comes with a, a complaint or a question or, or a query, it, it must be a really fundamental part of a of a successful digital um, inclusion um, service. And so that's something that must be valued and resolved properly along the way. Um, OK, I think that Brilliant. might be the end of our question. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for uh, 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 adeptly kind of navigating us through those and gathering the questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you to all of our speakers today. Really appreciate it. We couldn't have done this session without you. And we really appreciate you bringing, bringing your experience and expertise. Uh, so uh, final part of this session, which uh, we said we were going to do at the beginning and we will do at the end. So Joe, do you want to uh, sort the poll out? 
Absolutely. Yep. So this is just to um, to help us understand uh, to what extent your knowledge or, or confidence in designing uh, for more digitally inclusive services might have shifted as a result of um, what you've heard today. So I'm just going to launch the um, those two questions um, and ask you to, to complete those uh, in the next 30 seconds or so. See the numbers going up, which is great. Thank you for contributing. Brilliant. Thank you all so much for taking part in that. We'll just leave it open for a little bit longer. Um, just to say, as soon as we're able to, we will get all of these recordings, all of the presentations on our website, and we will let you know when they are available. I hope this has been useful in kind of moving you further along that journey in terms of how you're thinking about designing your digital inclusion services. All of us who have presented uh, as part of this seminar series have been only too happy to talk more about you uh, this with you and to hear more from you. Um, so please do get in touch if you got any questions or you'd like to explore what we've talked about even further. Thank you again. Take care.